Good morning, friends. This is Pastor Lori from First UMC in Kirksville, and it's good to gather with you today on this Tuesday as we move towards the end of June. We're working our way through Barbara Brown Taylor's book, An Altar in the World, and a subtitle on that is A Geography of Faith, and she explores many of the different ways that faith unfolds in places that we might not expect, that we might be surprised. And this week's chapter is called The Practice of Being Present to God, um, and it's all about prayer. Now, she starts this chapter um, with a really honest admission. She says, I know that a chapter on prayer belongs in this book, but I dread writing it. And she goes on to talk about how she has shelves full of prayer books and books on prayer. She has notes from classes that she's taught and taken. Um, she has all sorts of different prayer formats that she has tried to use at various points in time. She's, you know, has prayer beads, various tools to help with prayer. And then she writes, but I feel like I'm a failure at prayer. When people ask me about my prayer life, my mind starts scrambling for ways to hide my problem. I start talking about other things I do that I hope will make me sound like a godly person and try to say admiring things about prayer so there can be no doubt about how important she thinks it is. She asks the other person to tell them about her about their prayer life and hoping they won't notice that she's changed the subject. And I wonder if some of you might at times have felt a little like that. You know that Prayer is something very important, but maybe a little like we all know that exercise and eating well are important. It's not always a present part in our daily lives, at least in the way that we expect it to be. And she goes on to talk about some of the people who have helped her understand that prayer doesn't have to look a certain way that prayer does not have to follow a specific formula. And she came to realize that maybe she loves God very much, right? She says, and so how do I wrestle with this fact that I love God so much, but I don't pray much? She says, it's kind of like saying, I love life, but I don't breathe much, right? So she came to realize that maybe Either prayer is more than just what her original idea of prayer was, and that maybe some of what she does in her life already is actually a form of prayer, and just one that was unnamed. And so she shared that, you know, at one point in life, she had studied all the different types of prayer. Um, adoration and praise and thanksgiving, penitence, oblation, intercession and petition. And then she shares something that's probably common to many of us. She said, my problem was I couldn't keep them straight. When I prayed for people I loved who were sick was that intercession or petition. When I thanked God for the beauty of the earth, was that praise or thanksgiving? How could you try to fit any specific prayer into one category? And she reflects that she learned that prayer was not a contest. It wasn't the kind of thing that you had to try to fit your prayer into one category, but that those categories were just for sharpening our awareness of the different types of prayer, not as a way of being able to connect with God. And so she reflected, is it prayer? when I fret about people I know are in trouble, and when that worry kind of followed her around all day, maybe when she cooked dinner and she was thinking about those people lovingly as she prepared their meal, was that a form of prayer? When she went outside after everyone had gone to bed and just groaned while looking at the moon because she couldn't even form words. Was that maybe a form of prayer? And she had a teacher in her life, a monk in New York, who let her know that prayer is not the same as prayers. 
Prayers are important, he said. The, those are the things that we say. We say the Lord's Prayer each Sunday. Um, we might say psalms in the morning. We might have a specific prayer we pray before we do different things. He said those are, those are wonderful. Um, but they are not only, they're not the only way we pray. That prayer is so much bigger than just those. And she shared that she learned from this brother David that prayer is waking up to the presence of God no matter where you are and no matter what you're doing. That when you are fully alert to whatever or whoever is right in front of you, when you're aware of that tremendous gift of being alive, when you're able to just immerse yourself in that moment, then that is a form of prayer. And that prayer is happening sometimes even when we don't realize it because God is happening around us and through us even when we don't always realize it. This particular teacher really caught her attention when he said that even biting into a tomato can be a kind of prayer. Now, for those of us who know how delicious a homegrown, ripened on the vine, straight from the garden onto the BLT tomato is, right, we might be able to appreciate that. There is such a joy in that moment, right? It is almost something sacred, we might say, right, to have that gift. Um, we've just been in strawberry season earlier in May and June, those are kind of the same way, right? A strawberry that has been fully ripened, it's just kind of taken in all that sunshine and goodness. There are few things that can pass that. And so prayer, this is something that many folks have discovered. One of um, Brother Lawrence, who lived several hundred years ago, he's famous for um, his book. He didn't write this book when he was alive. It was actually a series of letters that he wrote to others that were published after he died. Um, and the practice of the presence of God, it's maybe best known for he would talk about how doing the dishes at the monastery where he lived could be a form of prayer. It could be a way of connecting with God. And so it inspired countless generations of folks to have this awareness that anything we do can become prayer. It doesn't have to only be in a beautiful chapel like this, right? We don't have to be on our knees. Sometimes both of those things can be very helpful and very important, but that prayer can happen as we are driving down the highway with our eyes wide open. Prayer can happen in the midst of all sorts of things. And that prayer can be this life of grace that increases through the hope of eternal life, and it is filled with pure love. So, prayers. What are, what are the places that maybe bring you difficulty around prayer? We probably all have times where we feel that our prayers have been unanswered, where we have prayed very specifically for someone or a situation, and we had such high hopes that God would answer our prayers in a very specific way. And that didn't happen. Sometimes that can even cause a crisis of faith. You may have been there at some point in your life. And most people do at some point. And Taylor reflects about that, even that question of does prayer work? Is that really the right question to ask? And she writes, is it right for me to ask God for particular outcomes when God alone knows what's right? Um, she goes on to say, that's how we go to God like a child, is when we simply pour out what is on our heart, right? When we don't censor first what we're going to say and try to decide if it sounds holy enough, but when we just express what's there. She goes on to say, 
that one of the point of prayers sometimes is to sharpen our hearing so that we can tune in to the ways that God is at work even and maybe especially when it doesn't fit what we're expecting to see. And I know many people who have, again, been in that place of maybe praying for a specific outcome or in a, especially in a really hard situation, that sometimes they discover that what comes as an answer is not what they originally prayed for. And that somehow it is still connecting to God. It still gives them an awareness of how God is at work, even if it's not what they were originally praying for. Um, because we want that evidence that God is real and at work in the world around us, right? We want, we want to know that there is a love and a power beyond what we can imagine that's at work in the world to bring good things, to bring hope and resurrection out of what seems lost. And she goes on to talk about these answered prayers, right? That sometimes it's hard to tell other people when a prayer has been answered, especially if it doesn't look like what you were originally praying for. And she reflects what sounds like an answer to one person sounds like silence to another. What seems like a providentially big fish to one person registers as blind luck for someone else. The meaning we give to what happens in our lives, that's where this freedom in connection with God comes. Only you can say whether God met you through what you prayed, right? And now we can have folks who have a lot of wisdom and experience in prayer to help us make sense of that, because sometimes we need to reflect on that with other people, to have a sense of, oh, hearing how someone else met their answer from prayer in a different way than they expected, that can help us have a wider image of how God was at work. Because she says, sometimes we're still waiting for God to answer us when right there in the middle of our life is the answer we've been seeking. And it's hiding in plain view. She goes on to share about how waiting itself can be a kind of prayer and talks about um, a time in her life in between those 15 minutes when her doctor gave her bad news about her health and the time she was scheduled for surgery. Um, that in that time she discovered how it was possible to love her life in ways that had never occurred to her before. As she would take a walk around the block, she would see the brickwork on a building that she'd never noticed. She would hear the sound of people laughing in a new way. She said she'd never allowed herself to take a bath instead of a shower, but she did in that time because she didn't know what was ahead. And so with waiting, she found herself in a different time, a kind of a different space of existing in the world. And you may have been through something like that yourself. Those times where time sort of slows down and you see everything around you in a different way. And she reflects that her new understanding of some of those simple pleasures in life that came from that waiting time were an answer to her prayer for more life, even if that life turned out to be shorter than the one she thought she wanted. And so that's fascinating, right? That sometimes those answers to prayer come in very different ways. And that this practice of saying thank you in advance for things to God, for the ways that our prayers will be answered, knowing full well that it may come in very different ways than what we anticipate, that that can help us build um, not just a practice of prayer, but to have that really soak into our entire being. And I kind of love how she writes this. She says, my hope is that if I can practice saying thank you now, when I still approve of most of what is happening to me, then perhaps that practice will have become habit by the time I don't like much of what's happening to me. The plan is to replace approval with gratitude. And the plan is to keep 
watching in the midst of what is for where God's ongoing answers are. Now, she goes on to talk about many different kinds of set prayers that she's encountered in her teaching of world religions to students. Um, and we know that sometimes a set form of prayer can be helpful. There may be times in life where we kind of need that reminder. We need that, um, just that ability to tune in on a regular basis. Now, there are other times in life where that will be more of a hindrance and we need to kind of let go. But if you're in a stage where you get the sense that maybe you'd like to make prayer a regular part of your day, one of the things that they had at our annual conference that we just came back from were some little 40 days of prayer cards. We'll have some of these here at the church and they're encouraging us to pray. 7 a.m., 7 p.m., or if those times don't work for you, pick a couple of times a day, maybe set some type of alarm, some type of reminder. Maybe you pair it with every day when I take my medicine or every day when I go to check the mail. To simply take the time, and there's a simple little prayer on the back of these cards that we'll close with here in a minute. And if you want, you might even choose to take one meal a day on Tuesdays to spend some of that time in prayer rather than focusing on food. Now, fasting isn't something we have to do. Some folks do find it helpful. And if that is the case for you, you might give it a try. But we'll try some of these. Um, their suggested time frame actually lines up with when our new pastor is starting on July 7th and the first 40 days of that. But again, Prayer does not have to follow a strict and set regimen, right? Prayer is a beneficial practice in all the ways it takes place. And that means it's not the kind of thing that if you miss a day, you need to beat yourself up and feel guilty. No, just jump right back in. Notice, so what was it the day before that you were in the midst of? And where were you seeing God at work in it? Reverend Jennifer does a great job of this in her Wednesday videos, helping cue us to notice where God has been at work. So again, if you're interested, we've got some of these little cards. Um, we're also happy to pop one in the mail to you. If you're not able to make it over to the church, just leave a comment here or send us a message and we'll be happy to drop one in the mail for you. So as you go into this week, be aware of where prayer is happening with that understanding that prayer is an awareness of God's presence. Prayer is seeking God's presence. Prayer is honestly sharing what's on our hearts with God. When my kids were little, um, I used to liken it to, you know, if God were a person, God would have really big shoulders. And even when we're in kind of that two-year-old, like, eh, I'm just throwing a fit kind of phase, right? God can handle it. God can hold us until we feel safe enough for that to pass. And then to be able to notice other things around us. So our prayer as we close today it's a fairly simple one, just a few lines. Gracious God, I seek you now. Show me how to follow you and be Jesus' disciple. Teach me to accept anyone and recognize that everyone is created in God's image. Lead me to stay deeply in love with you. Encourage me to do the work you have for me. And as part of a faith community, empower us with your Holy Spirit to your call in this place. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, may God's presence be with you in prayer. There was a piece actually in here I was going to share that I didn't. She talks about God's presence being kind of like a radio frequency. Um, and especially some of you who remember the days where we had to fiddle with the knobs to get to tune into a specific frequency, right, to catch a particular station, that those sounds were always being broadcast even when we weren't dialed into it. And that prayer is simply a way of dialing in to God's presence around us. So friends, go in peace. 
go in prayer. Um, this Sunday is Pastor Scott's last one with us. If you are here locally, we hope that you're able to join us for his retirement celebration after worship. And if you're not, um, if you would like to send in some thoughts that we could print out and share with him as part of his going away gift, uh, please do that. Um, you can send that to the church email and we would be, we would love to include those in his going away thoughts from our congregation. So go in peace. I will see you back here again next Tuesday. Go in peace, friends.